Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heart of the Matter. I am your host, Elizabeth Vargas. Glad to have all of you with us today. And we have a real treat today. We have uh, a guest who is releasing a book on this very day. Ryan Hampton has long been an advocate for addiction in this country. He's in recovery himself. He became addicted to OxyContin, as millions of others in this country have, after being prescribed the drug as a painkiller following an injury he got while hiking. After he got sober, he wrote a book called American Fix Inside the Opioid Addiction Crisis and How to Fix It. Well, now he's out with another book, and this book lands today in stores and on Amazon Books. It's called Unsettled. It's about, well, it's about his front row seat as a member of the Committee of Unsecured Creditors, which is a pretty clunky way of saying the group of people who negotiated the recent settlement with Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers, who own the drug company, to pay a $4.5 billion fine. You know, Purdue was being sued by nearly every state in the country. Thousands upon thousands of other victims of the opioid crisis are also suing the company. The settlement's been really, really controversial because it gives the Sacklers immunity from any future lawsuits of any kind, criminal charges of any kind, it basically allows them to walk away pocketing billions and billions of dollars in profit. In fact, in one of the depositions, there's a story, and Ryan tells it in this book, about one of the Sacklers under deposition. She said she was given a $4.4 million payment from the family fortune, but she can't even remember getting that payment or why. I don't know about you, but I think I'd remember getting $4.4 million dollars. At any rate, Ryan's been very critical of this whole settlement. He says victims will get only 10% of that big, huge settlement. The states will pocket the rest of that money. And it's, it's you know, he got to see a lot. He had a front row seat to the depositions from the Sacklers who have been incredibly effective at avoiding all publicity, all public comment. They basically hide out. And... Uh, Another reporter, Patrick Radden Keefe, who wrote Empire of Pain, of other, another guest on our podcast here, he actually read the book and he called Unsettled a Kafkaesque account of Ryan's experience inside the Purdue bankruptcy, something Ryan himself calls a bloodbath. Well, you're going to hear all about it in today's podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Here now, Ryan Hampton, the author of the new book, Unsettled. Ryan Hampton, welcome to Heart of the Matter. It's great to have you. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me, Elizabeth. Oh my gosh. Your story um, is so inspirational <laughs> to me and I know to so many others. Um, I want to start by reading something that you actually wrote for the Huffington Post a couple of years ago, um, talking about your life, you know, working in the White House and then becoming addicted to opiates. To say that I led a double life would be an understatement. My career put me in the public eye. I worked closely with President Bill Clinton and his advisors in the highest office of our government. My addiction, however, took me to the absolute depths of misery and isolation. From Pennsylvania Avenue, I ended up homeless, sleeping on a drug dealer's couch and begging for change at the gas station. Wow. Yeah. How did that happen? It's, um, you know, looking back now, um, and 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 really understanding where I was in my life, you know, and, and it's been a journey. I think since getting into recovery, you know, over six years ago, it's been a journey understanding how that did happen to me. Yeah. Um, because if you would have asked me that question six years ago, I would have said bad decisions, poor choices, you know, morally bankrupt all of those things. Wow. You bought into it all. <laughs> I bought into it all, but really understanding, you know, that it was trauma, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these were, these were things that were, that were, that started happening to me when I was younger. Right. And then kind of being in the middle of the pill mill epidemic in Florida, kind of like right place, right time. You know, oftentimes people say, hey, did your addiction, your opioid addiction start on that hiking trip that you had in 2003? You know, I, 
I injured my ankle shortly after leaving the White House. I, I was kind of having this up and coming political career and career in policy and community organizing and uh, working with labor unions and national, you know, the National Party Committee. And um, I thought that that's when it started. Right. But then after kind of really looking internally, you know, um, it started before that for me, but the difference for me was, did I drink in high school? Did I, you know, experiment with drugs in high school? Yes. You know, was it any different than, you know, my peers at the time? Um, no, it seemed like everybody was partying. The difference between me and them though, was that 10 years later, I did end up homeless, uh, on a street corner on Hollywood and Highland begging for help. You, a couple months ago, wrote an editorial for USA Today in which you said, substance use disorder is treated with disgust and disdain by people who do not understand it. Do we guilt trip people with cancer into recovering or expect them to get better without extensive treatment? No. Addiction is also a complex healthcare issue, yet people who struggle are criminalized, dehumanized, and left to die. Yes. It, it, it's, and yet, you know, in this country, 21 million Americans are struggling with substance use disorder. Why isn't there more public support and public pressure and public outrage given the tens of millions of people who are struggling with this? And by, you know, sheer just simple math, double, triple that number who are dealing with those people in their lives, who are witnessing firsthand the struggle to get clean, stay clean, get sober, stay sober. Yep. Um, great question. So there are people who are outraged. I am outraged. I know you are outraged. I know many guests who have been on here are outraged. There's uh, community organizations and national organizations such as Partnership and the work we do at the Voices Project, which is so critical um, to, to elevating those voices, not just of, of outrage, but of also solution. And as you noted, you know, the math is definitely on our side. On right. This. Like we know Sadly. the math, right. I, I mean, the math is on our side. I mean, you've got the 21 million, uh, 21 to 22 million people who are, you know, needing help right now. You add that to people like you and I, there's another 23 million just like us who claim uh, a status in long-term recovery. So roughly around 44, 45 million. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you divide that by households in the country you're looking at about one in three American households that are directly impacted by substance use disorder, right? right. Directly impacted, not indirectly, but directly impacted. Yet, so why aren't they burning up the phone lines to their congressmen? Exactly. So solutions are slow to come. I think a, a large part of that, and we've done a lot of great work uh, in this very you know broad movement of uh, families, people in recovery, people still struggling, people who use drugs, you know, uh, some you know choice policymakers um, to raise the level of the conversation, but we still need to do a better job at shedding down. People like to call it, you know, stigma. I think mm -hmm. stigma is like a nice word for prejudice, you know, yeah. systemic discrimination, bias, you know, and we have to combat that. That still exists for people like you and me and others who need help. It's it's certainly a personal decision, but a lot of people who do find recovery, you know, keep that very private and that's their right. And, you know, that's why your voices project is so powerful. Having people, more and more people speak about their recovery, how they found it, how they, you know, how they live now, um, provides sort of, it just chips away at that stigma. It, you know, which prevents so many people from reaching out and getting help. Um, because <laughs> poll numbers show so many people will judge them harshly for, Right. admitting that they have a problem. Um, you know, it's interesting when you talk about that lived experience. Um, you know, President Trump's own brother died of alcoholism. Um, and he did, you know, to his credit, declare a, you know, the opioid crisis a national public health emergency. But then he tried to cut the funding to the Office of National Drug Control Policy by a massive amount. Yeah, I will... Um <laughs> sidestep some of that question but i uh, i what i will what i will say is public health emergency let's just think about that you know declaration that term for mm. a moment right we have two we have a 
dueling public health emergencies right now in this country. We have COVID and we have the overdose crisis, right? Not to take away from COVID, right? My fiance had COVID. I know people who have died of COVID. My son's both had COVID. I mean, I, I've, I've seen the devastation in our community and into our economy. Mm. But the way the federal government and the states are responding to COVID is exactly how you deal with a public health emergency. Yet with the overdose crisis, we get a piece of paper with nothing really to back it up, okay? For every overdose death, right, if you include alcohol into the Mm -hmm. mix, you're looking at about uh, four COVID deaths, right? So four COVID deaths, one overdose death. Yet, and this is for last year, just for mm-hmm. last year, not in combined in 2020. Yet federal spending in addressing COVID is 750 times more than addressing overdose, right? Even um, though the overdose crisis costs our country right. billions with a B of dollars. Right, right. And... um a lot of this, though, is because still overdose, like going back to your, your previous statement, mm-hmm. overdose addiction is seen as a choice. It's seen as people kind of brought this on, them on themselves. Now, I'll have a lot to say about what government has said in my you know forthcoming book, Unsettled, because I was in some rooms where some stuff was said that just really opened my eyes to how some people in the government view us and view you know the, the reasoning for us getting into this overdose crisis. But I'll say one of the solutions is by sharing the story, is by shedding that shame. It is telling my story for the first time was one of the most terrifying things I have ever done in my life. Yeah, I did it first and I did it big in a, in a, in a Huffington Post article in 2016. And I almost didn't do it because I was terrified of what the outcome was. I was terrified I was if I would be able to, to get a job in the future. I was terrified about other family members who didn't know at the time, and they were going to read it in this article, you know, kind of this whole history of, of my, my, my journey through uh, heroin addiction. Um, but once I did it, it led me on this journey of what I like to call the journey of what's next, right? I felt empowered after, you know, being my authentic self. And I wanted to know what was behind door two, three, four, five, which led me on this journey of advocacy and activism and policy reform and really, you know, community organizing. Um, and I have seen that same uh, arc of a journey for many people who share their stories. They don't just share their story and stop. They want to share their story and then make this their purpose and their passion within their community. But understanding that still today in 2021, there can be consequences for sharing your story. And yeah. it is a very personal deep, you know, uh, you've got to, you've got to really know if it's right for you and if the timing is right. And if the circumstances are right, um, I encourage anybody who can do it to do it and to particularly not just for yourself, but for people who still can't, because people can still get fired. People can be denied health insurance. They can be, den- they can be denied, uh, life insurance. They can have issues with, you know, tenants and rent and et cetera. Like, I mean, there's, there's, they can have their kids taken away through a court hearing. I mean, there's just so many things that can still happen that keep people in the shadows. Right. You mentioned um, your forthcoming book, Unsettled, which you know, the passion in, in, in that book just burns through the pages. Um, you had been very active on Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family even prior to writing this book. But what I was so struck by was you were appointed to the Unsecured Creditors Committee. It's a kind of a formal name, but basically the deal was Purdue Pharma declared bankruptcy after the Sacklers, you know, removed billions of dollars of, you know, from the Purdue Pharma bank account into their own personal bank accounts. And then Purdue declared bankruptcy as a way to inoculate themselves uh, and the Sacklers from any future lawsuits of any kind. But so during these bankruptcy proceedings, you were part of basically, to make this simple, you were part of this committee that got to see and hear and read everything, like literally everything. Mm -hmm. 
how did you get on this committee? Well, I, um, <laughs> walk, you know, coming out of the fog on, uh -huh. on the bankruptcy, I'll first say this is something I will never want to do again. It was one of the most enraging, infuriating processes I've ever been involved in in my life. And I've been involved in a lot. You know, the, the, I was a novice, less than a novice. I knew nothing about bankruptcy law when I walked out of this. I feel like walking or walked into this, walking out of it, I feel like I could probably teach a course on it if I, if I wanted to at like Columbia or somewhere. I mean, it, um, I had I didn't know what the unsecured creditors committee was. I didn't know that there was a place for, you know, quote unquote victims uh on on the UCC when Purdue had filed for bankruptcy or was talking about filing for bankruptcy. Um I had been in discussions with several plaintiffs lawyers for for some time prior to Purdue uh making it, you know, public that they were going to file for chapter 11. And we had been looking at possibly some sort of like massive civil litigation against the company and against the Sacklers on behalf, almost like a class action mm -hmm. on behalf of individuals and families who had been harmed um, by, by Purdue's products and their tactics. And um, these same attorneys that I had been having these discussions with for some time when, when Purdue kind of changed the, 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 the venue, you know, when they went into bankruptcy court, they kind of went from, you know, playing ball on a basketball court in regular courts, right? The same, the type of litigation that you and I and justice are, are you know, the justice system, people who know the justice system are more familiar with, uh, over to like a hockey, you know, rink. We're really, it's a very specialized process. And these lawyers said, hey, you know, there's, there is a committee, there is a way for victims to have voice. There is a way for them to fight for dollars for commit for, for their communities and advocate on behalf of some sort of victim settlement uh, in the bankruptcy. But you have to get appointed to this, to this thing called the UCC, which the United States trustee at the Department of Justice for Southern District of New York kind of has full authority over, why don't you write him a letter, you know, and ask him to, to see if there could be victim appointments uh, to this committee. Now they've done this in the Weinstein bankruptcy, right? So when Weinstein had filed for, when the Weinstein company filed for bankruptcy, there were, uh, victims of, of, of Weinstein's, uh, you know, rape, uh, and, and sexual abuse that were appointed to this committee to represent the victim's interests. So I wrote the letter to the United States trustee and much to my surprise, um, got a message back from them and invited me to New York city, uh, like two weeks after the letter in, in September um, and asked me to come interview with the trustee. And I, and I went with several, I mean, there was a, there was a handful of, of uh, victim advocates who were there, uh, people that, you know, from the uh, NAS community, families, uh, people in recovery, people who were still struggling. Um, and I interviewed with the trustee um, and was point, like, I was completely shocked. I didn't go into it with any expectations uh, that I was appointed uh, to this nine-member committee. There were four victims that were appointed. And then that same night, I was actually elected by the committee as its co-chair, where I had to serve with Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is a whole <laughs> other story. Um, and I found myself in this room kind of catapulted overnight of power players that I had been fighting, mm. you know, for for years, right? Pharmaceutical companies, big insurance companies, you know, uh, hospitals, right? Um, folks that I had kind of been on the 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 other end of the spectrum with for some time, and uh, that launched it. And um, I I didn't know still that day like what the power of that committee was. But if you think of plaintiffs and defendants in a regular court case, there would be a defendant which would be similar to what the debtor is, which is Purdue. And then there would be the plaintiff. And in this case, it, it kind of the mega plaintiff is the unsecured creditors committee by statute, bankruptcy statute. It's the only fiduciary for all creditors in the case. So while there were a lot of, and this was a unique bankruptcy, there were a lot of state attorneys general and municipalities and cities, the official fiduciary of the case and, and, and the one that the judge looked to uh, more oftentimes than not was the unsecured creditors committee. We had subpoena power, we had discovery power, uh, we could call witnesses, uh, we reviewed millions of documents, you know, took depositions of all, I sat through 
hours, I mean, hours and hours and hours and hundreds of hours of testimony of the Sackler family. Right. Like I sat on a Zoom with Richard Sackler, with Teresa, with And what was David your Sackler. impression? I mean, after all those years yeah. of, you know, uh, of studying this issue and and, you know, I'm just curious because the Sacklers have been so hidden. They have yeah. run from their, you know, precious few pictures of them. They especially in the last few years as the utter enormity of the lying about the addictive properties of their drugs, the uh, the voracious push to the sales force to sell these drugs, um, you know, the hiding of everything, and then the raiding and looting of their own, of, of the fortune from Purdue Pharma. I'm just curious what your personal impressions were of the Sackler family. Because, you know, I, I, I've always wondered, and a lot of people have wondered, do they really, what, what do they tell themselves? What story do they tell themselves? I think about- that they're, I think that they have convinced themselves over, I mean, and, and I think there's, you know, <laughs> I'll have to be careful what I say here for a lot of reasons. Um, someone should study their heads mm. <laughs> at some point. Um, I think, you know, in, in Patrick Radden Keefe's book, we, we've learned there was some, you know, mental health challenges in the family. I think that they, some of the members of the Sackler family, um, particularly the B side of the family. Um, B side, what do you mean? Yeah. So like the, the, the Richard Sackler side of the family, um, cause the family is kind of, you know, divided into two divisions, the A side and, and the, the, the Mortimer side and the, and the, the Richard side, the, you know, and they, there's a lot of fights in between the two of them. Um, do but any I, members they, of the family say this is terrible? This is terrible. Well, we, you would hear we have blood would, on our hands. Yeah, I would say first. I would say there is a huge lack of empathy um, within the family. I think some members of the family have convinced themselves at this point that they have done nothing wrong, which is just crazy. Um, no apology, of course. I would always hear this: the opioid crisis is terrible. The overdoses are terrible, but we didn't have anything to do with it, you know? Um, and they were pretty dead set on that. They are, in my opinion, um, more evil, <laughs> uh, being face to face with them, you know, sitting face to face with David Sackler and Richard, um, more evil than they sound. Wow. Or, um, Richard, that's hard to fathom. I've got to be honest, Ryan. Yeah, because they sound pretty bad in you know the the transcripts that I've read. The utter yeah. disregard. The no, it's not our fault. It's you know the emails I, that have been released. It's 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 amazing. They blame the victim. Yeah, they blame the addicts. It's not our fault. Yeah, I um, they they blame us. Um, you know Richard's deposition in it, his specific deposition was really interesting to me. Um, he was the, he felt like throughout the course of his deposition, I mean, he was just so casual. Really? Right? It was like, oh yeah, well, you know, I mean, and his tone was casual and it felt, and what was frustrating, it felt like a guy who was giving a testimony who already knew he was going to walk, mm-hmm. you know? And he, he knew what the outcome was going to be like, there was, he didn't, he wasn't that, you know, very, uh, stringent kind of uptight, uh, Richard Sackler that we saw in the deposition from several years ago. Right. I mean, he was just very laissez faire, almost like it was a joke, you know, John Oliver did a, a now infamous thing where he took the transcripts of Richard Sackler and and David Sackler, their deposition. We didn't. He didn't have the video, so we had actors act out the lines. And he, you know, infamously had Michael Keaton playing Richard Sackler giving his deposition while eating a sandwich, which is what right. he actually did. Yeah, you know, right. cavalierly and casually while talking about something that led to the deaths of tens of millions of people. Yeah, and you know, you could tell the 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 
the kids in particular, you know, David and Mariana, I mean, they're just, you know, dead set that, you know, they've done nothing wrong. You know, it's the, the privilege of the family just kind of like seeped through my Zoom screen, right? And I'm sitting on mute, you know, I could have unmuted myself, but I'm sitting on mute with like 50 other people, all lawyers. I mean, what was so awkward for me is it was all lawyers. I mean, attorneys general for several states, you know, uh, 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 you know, heads of large creditor groups, you know, that are that are sitting on this call and the questioning of the depositions. And it was our committee, the Unsecured Creditors Committee, that was uh, deposing along mm-hmm. with the, at the time, what was the non-consenting states. And so I'm kind of like fish out of water on this Zoom, you know, uh, listening and I'm texting with the, I'm hearing things and like, I'm picking up on things and texting the lawyer, like, did, you know, the lawyers, I'm like, did you catch that? Like, are you, you know, are you going to like follow up on this? And I'm like, you know, really into it. Um, but I felt this deep sense of powerlessness, right? Because it felt as if the, it felt very performative for me because the case's outcome was also kind of predetermined, you know, at that point. And it was like, yes, we were getting these depositions and there was all these questions and, but we weren't really getting anywhere, you know? And it felt like, well, what's the whole point of doing this? Because at the end of the day, the Sacklers are going to walk no matter what. And they knew that, they knew that. So it wasn't kind of the same type of deposition that you would envision in some sort of like criminal trial, right? There wasn't the same type of urgency. There might've been an urgency on our end to get these answers, but there wasn't that type of urgency on the Sackler's end. And, and to them, I think they, uh, they felt like some of this was like a joke and they acted that way. They acted like fools. You know, there's been a lot written about, oh, they're, you know, persona non grata in New York society. They're fleeing New York City for, you know, Florida. Um, You know, institutions are taking the Sackler name off of buildings because, you know, nobody wants to be associated. I I can't believe I'm going to even ask this question, but I, you know, it's been written that they they are paying some small price uh, through their complete ostracism, which feels like nothing when you talk about the victims, the dead victims of the opioid crisis that all got hooked on opioids through OxyContin. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, is there any price there? I mean, they're walking away all billionaires. Well, well, wealth intact, wealth intact. And there's, there's, there's actually some modeling out there. So, you know, they, they're, they're, our committee found that their wealth, our committee found for, our, our committee found a lot, which Congress took credit for, which is fine because I'm glad Congress is getting it out there. But but our committee was the one that did the investigation, uh, found that their actual wealth was around $11 billion. Um, they're paying a settlement of about four point, you know, roughly around $4.3 billion spread out over nine years. Um, if you're to take the money and, and the way that they're paying the settlement though is a couple hundred million here, few hundred million here and spread out over this time, if you take the $11 billion that they currently have in the bank and you assume, you know, a pretty healthy standard interest rate, maybe around 7%, you know, there's an argument out there that says by the time they finish paying the settlement over time, they'll be worth um, more. They'll be worth about $16 billion. And so they will recoup anything that they're putting in by interest alone. And this final settlement that the former non-consenting states, the 15 of them agreed to, that essentially caved to, was pretty much identical in the larger framework to the, the, the deal that was on the table two years ago. And certainly the deal that has been on the table was on the table for the past you know six to eight months. So it's like, what did they really cave to and agree to to get on board uh, with the settlement. Well, I mean, they were like very, you know, small, I think kind of like meaningless wins in a sense. It's, you know, that you talk about the Sackler name. Well, many people don't know, like, okay, once the Sacklers pay the settlement, they could put their name wherever they want and they could still sue institutions that take their name off right now. Like that was supposed to be a sticking point, but it ended up falling apart. And, you know, the, the final states group, agreed with this 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 small provision 
um, the money that they increased in the settlement, most of it's coming from a trust Mm -hmm. that was owned by the deceased Beverly Sackler, which was supposed to go to charity anyway. And the family has no use for it. So it's not really money out of their pocket. Some of it is. Majority of it's coming from a trust they had uh, no use for anyway. And the documents, like we keep talking about privileged documents, uh, there, you know, there's like this prevailing thought and people think, oh my gosh, we're all going to get to see the Sackler secrets and, you know, Purdue documents. Yes, the public will get to see some privileged documents, but some of the Sackler's most guarded secrets will remain shielded forever because the privilege only applies to Purdue's privilege documents that they had in communication with the Sacklers. It does not include to privilege documents that the Sacklers have fought tooth and nail to keep from the view of this bankruptcy court since day one, which is in the tens of thousands. But having sat through all these depositions with the Sacklers themselves and having seen and read everything you have seen and read, is there any, I mean, is there any doubt in your mind that they absolutely knew that their drug was highly addictive and kept that knowledge secret while they pushed their sales force to sell it? No doubt. In other words, they, they knew, abs- they knew, they knew, they knew exactly what they were doing from day one. I'll leave it there. Like they, they knew, they saw, they, coordinated and 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 the, the the angering part of it is they didn't just know systems that were set up to protect us knew right like other people knew that were supposed to serve as watchdogs right and i go and i talk a lot about this in unsettled and i give some very mm-hmm. specific examples but as late as 2016 right like there were systems that were supposed to be in place that were failing in terms of auditing what was going on with Purdue and where these spikes in the in the medications were in OxyContin were showing up, right? And there was no action. So, uh, in my view, this the, like the Sacklers, we all know they're the villains coming out of this story. We know that Purdue is bad. The Sacklers are bad. But I think what people really need to put their arms around, and what I'm trying to convey through this book, which by the way, I I, I want to make public, like royalties from this book, like I'm not making money on this book. Like I've already said, like dollars from this book are going to charity, right? They are going to charity. Like I believe this story needs to be told. I believe that it needs to be put into the public's hand because if it's not told, it will repeat itself. And and folks need to understand that this was, I believe, a coordinated assault from many sides. And the end of kind of Purdue as we know it is ironic right? Because they're going to walk away from essentially all accountability because the system is built that way, right? Like they are, what they are doing and what they, a lot of what they did in the pre-bankruptcy days was really toe the line in the gray area, right? They skirted regulators, they involved regulators. There was probably indefinitely, you know, levels of corruption involved. And there oh my were, God, they, they, you know, the, FDA, and there the, were, the guy who led the, the FDA, FDA approval right, and I mean, wouldn't like, work for them. Right. So like, but all of this was allowed to happen and was legal. So it's like, and now they're, they have exited, uh, I'll say, or are exiting. The effective date is soon. Confirmation will be, you know, soon, but um, they've exited in a system that allowed them to exit this mm-hmm. way. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like the system was built to protect people like the Sacklers. Right. You, so, like, we have to look beyond the Sacklers and beyond Purdue to reform this on a much larger level, or else it will keep happening. You said uh, on cable news recently, we will not stop until Richard Sackler is behind bars. Oh, yeah. Not recently. That was, that was like right before I got, that was a couple months before I got appointed to the committee and that, um, pardon the expression, but was a pipe dream for me. I mean, like that's not going to happen. Right. But yet, yet I have friends who are sitting in prison for small marijuana charges and in jail in county jails and in prison for small amounts of drug distribution who are now in recovery, working a recovery program while in jail, they, they can't get out. I have one that's going to be sitting in there for three years, right? So, but but Richard, 
Dr. Richard, as he likes to call himself, he's never going to see a jumpsuit. Like he's never going to see his day inside of a jail. I mean, and, and, and really what folks need to understand is because this has always been not about that type of accountability for the Sacklers. It's been about money. This has been a big cash grab. It's been a big cash grab for states. It's been a big, big cash grab for different lawyer groups. You know, a lot of people made a lot of money in this bankruptcy. A lot of people made a lot of money. And um, we won't have that type of justice because the justice system is not equal in this country, period. Period. Ryan Hampton, thank you so much. Mobilize Recovery is an amazing program that uh, Ryan's been running. He also has the Voices Project, um, where he encourages people in recovery to speak out and tell their stories. Ryan, thank you for your passion and your expertise and your activism um, on an issue of great, great import in this country. Really, your work is hopefully going to change things for the better and at the very least, enlighten a lot of people as to what's really going on. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for listening today to Heart of the Matter. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And as a reminder, if you need help with a loved one who is struggling with substance use, you can text 55753 or visit drugfree.org. We'll talk to you soon.